city, quite a bit more than the city that's just a little bit to the north. I, I, <laughs> this is more my speed. Um, and this is your favorite bookstore. Yes, and this is my favorite bookstore in all of San Diego County. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of the other things I get a kick out of San Diego is the politics. I actually go on to your newspaper's website every month just to see who, what corrupt politician is getting run up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is amazing that they, it seems like every year somebody in San Diego gets taken down. And you think they'd learn to just not cheat people anymore, but whatever. Oh, Check Sacramento. Oh. No, they can't. Well, it, the problem is in Sacramento, they just don't get investigated the way they do down here, so they get caught. Uh, American Assassin was a book that I started thinking about writing back in 1995. I just finished writing Term Limits, which at, at that moment, the title, the working title was The Right to Rise Up. And um, fortunately, we changed that title. Um, how many of you have read Term Limits? I don't think I could write that book today. Um, if I tried to write it today uh, as a 44-year-old man who's seen different things in this world and now has kids and has money that they could take from me and a lot of other things, um, I, I probably would have pulled a bunch of punches and it, it would have never been that raw. I, um, and needless to say, they wouldn't publish it back then. I had to self-publish it the first go around. Um, if that book landed on a publisher's desk in New York right now in this political climate, I mean, they would freak out. Um, I laughed. A, a woman 15 minutes ago came up and told me that that's my favorite book. And um, I was kind of look up and make sure that, you know, they're unarmed and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Ask if they're in the FBI's database. Um, it, uh, but there's something raw about that book. I mean, there's... That was the book that kind of got it all going for me, that um, it's, it's really not hard to paint the politicians as a villain. Um, I, I think, you know, the people in the country get that. I've, I've been talking lately about, uh, to writers groups who want to know, you know, how do you get published, how do you write a book? And for me, it was a little easier in the sense that uh, the heroes in my mind are the men and women in the military, men and women who work for the FBI, CIA, Secret Service, the people who put it on the line for not a lot of money. Um, and that's how I approach these books, and that's why I think they've resonated and they've built such a cult following. You know, I've never been reviewed by the New York Times. <laughs> the New York Times has never written an article about me. And, you know, this book will be one of the top ten selling novels in America this year. And I'm still not even on their radar screen because they just don't get it. They don't get that that's the way most Americans think. Um, and that's also why their circulation is going in the toilet, because they've, they've missed that boat for the last 20 years. But, you know, a, lo a lot of journalists go to try to write novels. And so who do they make their heroes? Journalists. Now, that's like trying to make a politician a hero. It's, that's a pretty tough one to get people to buy into, right? <laughs> so, you know, that, that's kind of my, my secret of how I started going about this. And then when I started working on the Mitch Rapp character, I knew Michael O'Rourke wasn't the kind of guy that I could write 20 novels about. It just it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. So I wanted to write a character who had decided due to a traumatic event in his life, Pan Am Lockerbie, that he wanted to go be the tip of the spear. He wanted to go overseas and kill people. And I've, I've gotten into this debate quite a bit over the last few years. In fact, I, I had dinner with General Petraeus in Washington last fall, and we had this discussion. I still can't, I'm still not sure why the General wanted to have dinner with me. Um, I think he actually is a little nervous that so many of his guys read these books and he, he thinks <laughs> so, think it's okay to do the left foot, right foot, left knee, right knee, and you know, all that stuff. But um, we got into a rather pointed discussion about, you know, what is morally acceptable. And I said, you know, General, I, I, with all due respect, I do not see the moral difference between somebody who used to be in the special forces or a special operator who now works for a shadow organization in the government 
I don't see the difference between that individual putting a gun to someone's head in an alley in Istanbul and pulling the trigger and firing a Hellfire missile from a Predator drone into a mud hut. That, that, in fact, I think the argument is that the surgical strike in Istanbul, the assassination in an alley, is cleaner because you don't kill the little kid in the hut next door. Nobody wants to confront that. Nobody wants to talk about that. Uh, Mossad last year did an amazing operation in Qatar where they went in and they killed that jerk from Hamas who, you know, was the head of their paramilitary wing and they got into his room and they suffocated him. And everybody flipped out, oh my God, you know, well, how, how dare they do this? And they missed the fact that this guy has been recruited, his whole life he recruited suicide bombers, young kids, and sent them over into Israel to blow themselves up on buses. And we're actually all upset about the way Israel did it. This is the guy that arranged for the Palestinians to get uh, illegally get rockets into the occupied territories and then lob them into uh, Israel. I'm sorry, this guy deserved to die. You know, he, he had been calling for the destruction of Israel for years. And I think that most people in the privacy of their own home when they read these books, they're like, yeah, give it to them. <laughs> you know, how many of you, when, when Mitch Rapp is taking it out on some guy, you know, close the book and go, oh, I can't read anymore, this is horrible. <laughs> horrible. <laughs> some of you might do it and then come back and, and just reflect. You do want to see what happens? But you know, they're, it's, that, it's that Orwell uh, Churchill quote. You know, there's bad men out there. And you can't, as we as we learned recently, um, it was a noble idea that if we just changed uh, the person in the Oval Office, the world would fall in love with us and peace would break out and it wouldn't be a problem anymore. Well, the problem was we, we did elect somebody who was drastically different from the previous president, and Ahmadinejad and the rest of the kooks treated this guy with as much disdain, disdain as they treated the previous guy. And so we... We either have to allow our government to start doing more of the kind of stuff that I write about, or we're going to have more 9/11s. And it's it's a it's there's really that's what it comes down to. If you're not going to go on the offensive and go hit these guys, you will end up with another 9/11. And it's it's going to I'm really worried that they've and I, I've got to give this president credit on something. He's afraid as he should be. I mean, it's his job to protect us. Uh, and so he's up these predator strikes. I mean, they are going after these guys. They're trying to disrupt them as much as they can. And what do we have? The lovely ACLU is suing our just, they, I, 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 can't, I don't even know how they're doing this, but it's going through the Justice Department or how they're setting it up. But they're suing us to try to stop the United States military from these predator strikes because we haven't declared war on who? I mean, these guys won't put on a uniform, they won't face us on the field of battle. Um, that, in my mind, is proof that we have too many lawyers, or at least too many lawyers with too much time on their hands, that they sue over that. Um, you know, the fact that we're trying to kill members of Al-Qaeda of Al -Qaeda on the other side of the border in Pakistan, I, I think most of us would agree is a good thing. Uh, especially when they say that they would, ideally, they'd like to get their hands on a nuke and set it off here in America. So. That's where the passion comes from. That's why I think these books keep selling. And um, I don't know, it's gonna be interesting. I, I, within about 12 hours after the towers fell, and this is part of the writer's mind, I sat there in my home and I cried and I didn't cry. I'd already cried that morning, but I cried again because I saw where it was all going. I knew that it would be a matter of just a year or two before the politicians turned on each other in Washington and we started tearing each other apart instead of unifying and doing what had to be done. Because the truth is, we've become a very comfortable, affluent country. And these guys, these terrorists, there aren't a lot of female terrorists. I don't know if anybody's noticed that. Um, it's one of my big beefs with the now Wild Pow gang out in Washington. <laughs> They love to jump to the aid of Islam. I grew up a Catholic kid in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I vividly remember those organizations coming after the Catholic Church because they did not allow women on the altar and they wouldn't allow women to become priests. And I have yet to hear those women jump out and criticize Islam for the exact same thing.
but they are a nasty group of guys. And they are tough, and they're not afraid to die, and the only way we're going to stop them is to send some nasty guys after them. So on that happy note, we're going to open up the Q&A. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Vince, with, um, I've asked this question of different authors, and I want to ask it of you. With what you write and who you write about, how concerned do you get about your own security? I, I do, but I figure I'm in San Diego, so I'm pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a few guys in the audience that could kill somebody before they got close to me. Um, you know, I go back and forth on it, depending on the most recent threat. There's times where I really worry. There's times where I freak out. You know, I'm up in the middle of the night with a, my gun out, walking around the house trying to figure out what the hell's going on <laughs> because something had happened the day before. Uh, we've had people, you know, we live in a very remote area of the Twin Cities, and we've had a couple of situations where people have come down the private road at night with the lights off and the security lights go on, and, you know, it's you just you get worried about that stuff. But where I keep my sanity on the deal is... And I'm going to say this half in jest, but I, I know this person, so I know both these guys actually, so and I have to tell the same thing to their face, so I'm not stabbing them in the back. Um, I'm pretty far down the target list. I figure you got Rush and O'Reilly and a lot of other guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to go after them before they come after me. Now, you know, I've been told by you know my friends in the government that I, it would be a horrible idea for me to go to Pakistan. It would be a horrible idea for me to go to Pakistan. It's just, it would not be smart. So I worry about it, but um, is anybody recording this? <laughs> Just the guy over there with your gun. Well, I'm not going to be. I'm not. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to start to edit some of my answers because it's being recorded. Oh. Turn it off. So. Um, Turn it off. Turn it off. Um,